The Russians have always wanted to make fool of us, and I have always thought that we are not dumber, but rather smarter than them, and we can trump them. They had been told already that, well, start preparing, because you will need to get out of Ukraine territory soon. I worked here as an exorcist, but it all started with this. You won't read this in a book. We have been thinking long and hard about where to start the shooting of this film. We had many ideas. The magnificence that you are going to see now cannot be seen from any other place but there. That's why, you know, it's going to be a memory for all of my life. This set is anniversary of Ukraine's independence. Look at that power, look at that spirit. I've lived in Ukraine my whole life. Together with Ukraine, I have grown up, studied, lived through ups and downs. 30 years since the renewal of Ukraine's independence, that's quite a landmark. The moment of coming of age for both a human being and a state. The moment when we have recalled how have we gotten here and answered the question, what's next? What do we strive for? This film is my personal challenge, since this isn't what a regular film in the usual sense. These are reflections and recollections about events that have affected each one of us. But it won't be only about memories or reflections from the past. I want to share some thoughts with you about the future. Everyone has his own or her own truth. At the same time, there is only one truth. And today, I'd like to invite you not to an office, but to share a journey throughout Ukraine. I am going to show you our country as I see it. And I'll invite you to my talks with people whose thoughts I listen to, people who have the courage to speak about successes and failures, ups and downs, truths and untruths. People from whom you are never going to hear what is the difference when the fate of our country is at stake. This was where Lenin was standing, and this street used to be called Lenin Street, and now it's Main Street. It hasn't changed. It has rather come back to where it should be, to true story. At the time of the August coup, I was with my parents in Soviet-style resort. I remember the TV broadcast very well, Swan Lake. And the coup happened, and half of the people staying in this uh, vacation home disappeared. But why did they disappear? Because the top party officials called all of them immediately to Moscow. And in the morning, I came out to the beach, and in short, there was a strolling man there. He looked to me like a Komsomol official from Moscow. And I was quick to say, your time is up now. My dad asked me, why did you say that to him? My father has taught me to be smarter. And I said, that is the end. Here we are. How have we felt our independence? You know, we have felt independence also through symbols. Why? Because look, the law department where I studied moved. How do you think work to? To the premises of the Communist Party Regional Committee. It was almost like a mausoleum, this regional committee building. Only a select few people would be admitted inside. And we were just students. There were Soviet flags, flags of the URSSR and Soviet Ukraine, and now the flags of independent Ukraine appeared. It basically changed our consciousness immediately. Well, this is it, right here. These windows, you see? 
These were the windows of the Dean's Office of the Distance Learning Faculty of the Chernivtsi State University. And here my dad worked, Petro Ivanovich Yatsenyuk. He was the Dean. Here the walls are imbued with true spirit. It was actually a heroic feat of the university faculty. Those people who, from scratch, re-established the university law department that had been closed by the Soviet authorities. Like the Ukrainian state renewed its independence. Minds were not changing as fast as real life changed. Well, because of the sluggishness of thought. Until now, they haven't fully changed. One third of Ukrainian population continues to live in the Soviet past. 30 years have passed, though. 30 years. And those people, I understand them. Well, they used to live in a completely different system, a crusty one. And the same thing happened to the political establishment of that time. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't have the knowledge or experience, understanding or vision. For the first time ever, the only place to make some money, I believe, not only in Chernivtsi, but in Ukraine, appeared here. This used to be called, and now is called, Kalinivsky Market. Back then, the whole country used to go to marketplaces, and the biggest market was in Chernivtsi. The most important thing, when one goes to the market to sell anything, is not to have rain. Because if it does rain, you'll be up to your knees in dirt and less customers will come. How was the selling done? How did it look like? Instead of these market boxes, there were cars. I drive my car here. All the cars stood in line. Then I'd cover a trunk or a hood with some rug and put my goods on it. And so I started at 5 in the morning. And by around 8 a.m. I have sold all my stuff. And then I was back to school. Well, sometimes it happened that in one such a day I would earn more than my father, the professor, and in a month. If paid at all, salaries were too little at the time, and sometimes they were not paid at all, because there was nothing to pay them with. I recall well when these pieces of paper called stamps appeared. Not coupons, but stamps. They were like a big blank, made of paper, printed at some publishing company, and featuring the words soap, two items, sugar, one pound, butter, two packs. You would take those stamps and head to the store. And in the store, unfortunately, even you had these stamps, there was no butter, no sugar, nothing anyway. And this situation lasted for around two years. And then I gathered all my friends and told them, look, folks, this won't going to last forever. This period is over. We have to set up a firm. And the firm was set up in 1992. I registered a company named Jurek. Why this name was chosen? Because of two first words, jur for judicial and AK for economic. We were students. We got a license from the Department of Justice. And then I said, that's it. We are done with the business, commerce, retail and markets. From now, we will focus only on what we actually studied for. However, it had all started with this, with the cars, hood and trading in the mud. But we managed to survive. And so did the entire country. I think there is also the memories of the entire country. Mikhail Trofimovich, please tell me, how did the Soviet Union collapse? And what did you think then? What did you think would be the next? We thought it would be hard. Had you ever thought that it would collapse? When did you start to feel that the Soviets was finished? When the August coup started, I guess. Mm -hmm. The coup was the last drop. Few had thought that it would move so quickly. And when the 90s started, what was the brightest impression you had? What was the most dramatic impression you had? There were no jobs. Chernivtsi had been a city with a well-developed military and industrial sector, with military plants that employed thousands of workers, and then all of this stopped. Besides, I've been told that although we were friends with Russia and Yeltsin at that time, 
Yeltsin issued a secret order that everything should be duplicated. All technical, technological documentation should be duplicated and parallel production in Russia should be launched. Thus, Russian liberalism ends at the point where Ukraine starts, where the Ukrainian issue starts. It happens even back then. Many years have passed since I drove this road. In 2009, I moved to Crimea after being appointed as a Minister for Economy of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. And I drove my car repeatedly from Kyiv to Simferopol and Simferopol to Kyiv. And I knew every single pothole on this road because the road, frankly speaking, has not changed dramatically since then. It would take about 10 hours to make it to Kyiv. I could have never thought that a time would come when I wouldn't be able to go to Crimea. It sounds like a crazy joke. How could this happen? Crimea. Well, it has always been specific. It has always been Ukrainian, though. Back in the days, this place was full of life. We were trading in fish and vegetables. With crowds of people. But now it's dead. After the Russian invasion of Crimea. It's a desert. There is the Russian smell, Russian spirit. That's what happens when Russian spirit comes up. And it's not only about the absence of tourists about the fact that people stopped coming to Crimea, to our Ukrainian Crimea. They don't even allow fishermen to go to sea. They put their military ships all around, everywhere. Russians leave only scorched earth behind. And allegedly, they are not present there, but their smell stinks all the way from there. I lived there, not for a day, not for a month. I lived there for two years. It was a part of my life. And there are millions of people like me. I worked at the Ministry for Economy in Crimea as to whether much attention was paid to Crimea or no. I recall it was 2002. No one knew the word decentralization yet. No one even knew how to spell it. Although in 2002 already we agreed with Kyiv that a part of the local taxes and duties would be left in the budget of the Republic of Crimea. And this was 20 years ago, could you imagine? We used to go far and near here. This is our land. This is our territory. And can you imagine? Now there is almost a borderline here, in fact. This is called an administrative border. I mean, down there is also Ukraine, but we cannot go there because Putin's troops are stationed there. But why are Putin's troops stationed there? This story is a lasting one. Russians have always encroached on Crimea. They have done it implicitly. For instance, by hiring the huge number of assets why did Putin come to Crimea? It was a showcase. And this is also our territory. He also did it explicitly. When they came to Tuzla, at that time Leonid Kuchma, the former president of Ukraine, came back from a trip abroad. And in fact, we were in a situation of military standoff with Russia. And then Kuchma stood up firmly for Ukraine. It was an infringement upon Ukraine and upon Crimea. Crimea will not return tomorrow. This is the reality. Will it return to Ukraine? Yes, it will. There is a global justice. The same way the Berlin Wall fell. The same way the Soviets collapsed. 
The same way the Baltic states, whose occupation has not been recognized just like today, the world doesn't recognize the occupation of Crimea, became independent. The same way Ukraine became independent. Likewise, the non-recognition of Crimea's occupation will make Crimea return to its family. Vitaly, you know, that's new to me. Usually I don't listen to anyone but myself. I know, it's not news. Well, it's not news at all. In short, everything has changed. I've started to listen to you. Do you feel uncomfortable? I'll tell you a secret. When I interview someone, I also do not listen to anyone. It's not news to me either. How would you assess what Putin did in 2014? First, his decision to illegally annex Crimea and invade Donetsk and Lugansk. If you talk to Putin now, I think that he would be confident that he did everything right, because he followed the old principle, which was not formulated by him, to transform a statehood into a handicapped one. Well, if it was possible to act like that towards Georgia and Moldova, then why couldn't the same be done with Ukraine? Moreover, the idea of Crimea's annexation had already been considered by Russia's political leadership since 1990. It wasn't new at all. Putin ruined the idea that had existed in Russian-Ukrainian political thinking since the Pereyaslav Council, the idea that a Russian would not shoot a Ukrainian. Even the Bolsheviks, when they took over Ukraine, they basically portrayed it as a civil war. And when Putin said in his famous interview that when a Russian soldier came to Ukrainian territory, women and children would stand in front of him because it was going to be their own army, he really believed that due to his mentality. But it did not turn out that way, and he has torn it apart, that link. It is us who are right, because it is us whose land has been grown. We have not taken anything from anyone. So what do we have to do? Stand still? Wait? Stay resilient? What do we have to do? The first thing we have to do is we have to understand that we are dealing with a protracted conflict that is going to take years, decades. The second thing is we have to recognize that the responsibility lies on Russia, that Russia is to be responsible for restoring our territorial integrity, because it has violated that territory integrity. Putin always goes as far as he is allowed to go, but not a step further. And, by the way, we have seen that after 2014. I talked then to my Russian contacts, asked them whether they were ready for a big war. These were the people that participated in decision-making and knew how those decisions were made, and they told me explicitly, no, there won't be a big war, but we'll pour some gas on the entire perimeter. Basically, Kyiv is a city of revolutions and winning revolutions during times of Ukraine's independence. And Institutska Street is a historic place for many revolutions. I do remember the Orange Revolution. I used to work right over here. I was in charge of the Central Bank of Ukraine. And all major events were happening right there, near the presidential administration. And I saw then for the first time how the riot police, named Berkut, settled in to block the demonstrators. And there was a huge crowd of demonstrators during the Orange Revolution here, but it was cold then. And I took the decision to open this door and to let people into the National Bank of Ukraine, which is actually the central bank, to warm themselves. And there were also medicines, water, tea and coffee. Well, let's enter and have a look at the major financial institution of Ukraine. There is no cash here. But there used to be a cash vault once, though. And I knew that the opponents of the Orange Revolution had an idea to send the demonstrators to the National Bank, allegedly in order to grab the money storage here. But they didn't know that I decided to move the cash out of the central office of the National Bank and moved it to the Mint facility, because I knew about their plans. On Sunday, I am not sure when it happened, we can easily check it in the internet. During the events of the Orange Revolution, I figured out that the situation was getting worse and it became so tense in the central bank that actually started to boil in. 
I decided to summon all the staff of the National Bank. The majority of them were thinking that since I was in charge of the Central Bank, I would tell them not to participate in the Orange Revolution and ban them from going to Maidan and would enforce strict sanctions. All the staff got together. And you know, all of them stood in complete silence. Everybody was waiting for the final verdict. And I said, listen, my fellow Ukrainians, I know that most of you are secretly going to Maidan. Moreover, I don't mind. And I allow you to go to the Maidan. But serving the state is a duty for all of you. And what I am going to ask you, if two out of the department go to participate in the revolution, then all the others have to stay at the department because it has to operate. The National Bank started to act better than it used to be. People felt their responsibility. Responsibility for the system, responsibility before the people of Ukraine. And at the times of Maidan, we had a big challenge over here at the National Bank of Ukraine. Maidan was a revolution. Revolution means uncertainty. Uncertainty means fear. Fear, what does it bring with it? People rushed to withdraw their cash. I came to the office early in the morning and got a report. ATM machines in different banks got smashed. Out of order, out of cash. There were lines in the banks. People were standing in the long lines and trying to withdraw their deposits. And the national currency severely depreciated. I gathered the bankers and said, folks, now we have to be well coordinated. This is not the Titanic. We will make it on this ship. I am to impose the toughest banking regulations now and ban the withdrawal of deposits, temporarily impose a fixed currency rate, ban currency speculations, limit the currency flight. In other words, introduce the most draconian policies and methods. And the situation was stabilized within a few weeks. What actually helped to stabilize the situation? People had trust. They believed that we would save their money. What happened in the end? The exchange rate went from 8 grivnas back to 5 grivnas per dollar. I remember why did I decide to write a book called Banking Secrecy during the period of the Orange Revolution. Because I've seen they already started to rewrite the history. I mean, I want to provide not a version of the truth, but the real truth. In this field, I have the same goal. I'd like to write the truth about events and how I see the country's development through these glasses of mine. Odessa. Odessa. Sunny. Easy going. Amazing. I came here in 2005, after I ran the National Bank. After we saved the national currency, and we saved it indeed. After we saved all the banks, and we also saved them, and we saved people's deposits. I expected to get some kind of state award at least, and I got it. I was deployed to Odessa. Actually, when one says Odessa, the people of Odessa themselves correct it and say, you should say Odessa. And I learned to say Odessa. I can't help mentioning a language issue in Odessa. Why? Because basically Odessa is a Russian-speaking region in its majority. And do I accept it? Of course, I have to. Because yes, people speak Russian. However, the issue of the national language, the issue of the Ukrainian language, is not an issue of communication in everyday life. Both in Crimea and in Odessa, I have always defended my stance, regardless of me working in the Russian-speaking regions. Come on, this is our native Ukrainian language. This is the language of our country. Let's try to learn it. We can do it. This is just a question of respect to our homeland and to ourselves. And when we were in Odessa, you know, I looked at Ukraine in a different way. Ukraine became wider for me, basically. Spin doctors try to elaborate a way how to split Ukraine. 
And I remember the elections of 2004. They came up with the map where Ukrainians were divided into different categories, high profile and low profile. That was intentional, a political technology. That was elaborated by Russian spin doctors, by the way. How to split Ukraine, how to divide the country, how to encourage anti-Ukrainian sentiments. These were their tasks. A huge network of pro-Russian political forces and proxies was created. The Russians hoped that Odessa would fall. They hoped for insurgencies in Odessa to start like they had in the entire Ukraine. The idea was to take over Odessa and to impose the Russian regime. But Odessa didn't fall. Odessa survived a terrible tragedy. And the pro-Russian forces were behind it. It's about the arson of the trade union building. But Odessa survived this tragedy too. Odessa stood firm. Odessa is indeed very special. Yes, the city has its own viewpoint on everything, but that's a good thing. Well, people are frightened of changes. But for me, so-called stability has a bad smell. When they say we are for stability, this reeks of a graveyard. We are for stability means we are for doing nothing. We are for changing nothing. Let's live in a swamp. It is always stable. And the frogs crow. Two thousand and four was the first attempt. The Orange Revolution was the first real attempt by Ukrainians to make a choice as to where to go. Because the Orange Revolution was the revolution for justice, of course. And it was the revolution of the first Western choice, because it was a pro-Western president. Therefore, the spirit of Maidan was the spirit of both civil and economic freedoms. And that's why entrepreneurship started to develop fast. Plus, Maidan was, you see, such a kind of a business card for Ukraine around the world. The world business Businessmen, investors, foreigners began to see Ukraine differently. This is a country that is interesting for investments. I remember that as a Minister for Economy of Ukraine, I wasn't ashamed for the country and wasn't ashamed for the Ukrainian economy. But later, you see where it went. Just one click and the tide has turned in the completely opposite direction. And who then won in 2010? An anti-Western, pro-Russian president. There were frictions among Ukrainian politicians who came to power then. Instead of fighting for Ukraine, they started fighting for power in Ukraine. Where did you get this idea from? I think everything starts with the freedom. What we did with Kriivka from the very beginning, we felt free. Firstly, entrepreneurship is a personal freedom in itself. Secondly, we could do that in a way different from how it used to be done in Ukraine. I mean, there are mostly some oligarchs, mostly someone under some protection, security officers, prosecutors, and these sort of creeps, but we felt like free people. I recall the period when Kuchma left and Yushchenko came to power. Those were golden times when everyone started to invest. How did you start doing business? What was the biggest problem you faced? And what were the most important issues? When we opened Krivka, we needed to collect like 450 signatures to open a restaurant in Lviv. Are you kidding? Really 450? Now it's not like that anymore. How many now? We didn't count. Well, I don't know. I think something like 60. It was 450 back then. I mean, if one even collected one public official signature per day, taking into account that officials also have some days off or some other engagements. That way, only to collect those signatures. You need at least a year and a half. And we opened it. According to our business plan, we opened a restaurant in up to three months. Well, what do you need a state for? What does it give to you? That's a good question. Listen, why do we need a state? We're always talking about that. Well, first of all, it provides us with rules of the game. Rules of the game for people, for businesses, and one must play by the rules. There are two parts to that. 
One is that we need state only for some global things, things that we cannot do ourselves, like infrastructure, security. Also, we need to have an army to protect us. We need to have infrastructure, some roads. It's not like we will chip in together and build roads ourselves. However, on the other hand, the state is freedom, because a lot of people can only dream of having their own country. What would you like to tell policymakers if they all gathered in one room, whether you knew them or not, and as you tell them anything you wish, what would you say? Probably I would ask them not to interfere, just do not interfere. Well, I'm not sure we'd like to talk to them much. Wouldn't you? It takes you a personal time. You can hike in the forest or you can talk to policymakers. What would one consider more useful? We have to be aware. There is no other way for this country to recover than to be recovered by entrepreneurs. No one else can do it. Look, I will give you a few examples. For instance, we are here and next to us is the Old Lion Publishing House. Translations of Ukrainian books by the Old Lion Publishing House are being sold all around the world. I mean, we sell our Ukrainian intellectual product to the world. For me, this is a first-class performance in business. In other words, little kids in South Korea read books by Ukrainian writers and they understand that these are Ukrainians. Ukraine has always needed strong representation abroad. You need to know how to do it. You know, there is a Ukrainian saying, one knew how to cook, but didn't know how to serve. So we need to present ourselves to the world in the right way. We had a lot of meetings with the Americans. I came to Condoleezza Rice and brought a map of Ukraine with its neighboring countries. And I showed it to her saying, Madam Secretary, here is Belarus, the Russian Federation's ally and the member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is controlled by Russia. Here is our border with Russia. Look how long it is and how many troops deployed are there. Here is the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. Here is the Russian Black Sea Fleet and Russian military. Here is the Transnistria. Russian troops are stationed there too. Russia has basically surrounded us. It was 2007 or 2008. Then I met with the Russians and we had a dialogue. By the way, back then we had just started the procedure of changing the conditions of the Russian Black Sea Fleet lease of the Ukrainian territory. And then actually all kinds of political statements were made that the treaty about the fleet would be terminated. The treaty should have expired in 2017. And the Russians were told to start preparing because they would need to get out of Ukraine. As the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I flew to Kosovo to visit our K-4 troops. And on my way back, one of the planes to engines stopped. Well, that's what I'd like to tell you. I wish you could have seen the faces of those people flying with me. But I saw at once that something was wrong. Then I told the captain, has one engine stopped? He was so happy, you know, like in the name that tune. He said, yes, yes, you guessed right. I asked him, what is the plan? Metal chips in oil, he replied. What the hell does it mean? Well, he said, if there are metal chips in the oil, then that's it. We have to stop the engine, because if we start it, it will catch the fire. I said, oh gosh, so what is the plan? He said, well, we are going to land at the nearest airport. And so little by little, we made it to Kyiv airport. It took us five hours instead of two. I said to all generals that were on board with me, look, folks, don't worry about it. I have big plans for life. The plane will not crash. There is a complete silence in this hall. By the way, you know, the people hate members of parliament. The history of my time as the Speaker of the House was extremely interesting. It is when I signed together with the then President and Prime Minister a letter to NATO 
asking to provide us with the NATO membership in the action plan. And then things got heated. Russians, with the party of regions and Yanukovych, blocked the house for 47 days. They brought no NATO balloons to the parliament and blocked the parliament for practically two months. These walls have witnessed landmark events in our history. Starting with the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine, and up to the time when we finally made the decision that Ukraine's course toward the European Union and NATO is the only one, and enshrined this in the Constitution. This decision was made within these walls. First impressions about this hall. I really hated the communists. I can tell you frankly. I didn't like them very much. And they hated me even more. They were always sitting over there, in this corner. Not only did I hate their guts, but I also launched a decommunization. I was like an exorcist here. You know, exorcists are those who cast out the devil. I came to this hall and saw these some devils indeed. Soviet sickles, Soviet hammers, Soviet stars, Soviet symbols. Symbols, and also these awful red chairs. To cut it short, I took a decision to have urgent repairs done. There were Soviet symbols all over on the chandeliers. And you see, they are gone now. There were stars, sickles and hammers everywhere, all over the perimeter. You can see it from the archive record. Everything has gone. I became the youngest speaker of the house. And there was an intrigue then. The intrigue was as follows. They would vote for me for as a speaker. And the vote on the nomination for the prime minister was planned after that. They wanted to negotiate me to prevent Timoshenko from becoming prime minister. We had a coalition with her party at that time. I came out with an interview in advance and said that if Timoshenko didn't become prime minister, I would resign. And then, for the first time in Ukraine's history, the voting was done not with the ballots, but with the show of hands. My vote was the last one, 226. My last name starts with Y. So they read my name out last. So that's how Yulia Timoshenko became the prime minister. Za. <laughs> More interesting facts from that time. Well, you know, the MPs didn't really go to work back then. In a word, one beautiful morning, I came to work to this hall, and I needed to start a plenary session, but the party of region MPs were blocking something there, as usual. I came to the hall, opened the meeting and said, Dear People's Deputies of Ukraine, today we are going to do it in a different way, new one. What does it mean in a new way? How is it going to be in a new way? And I said, yes, it is going to be changed. I have signed an executive order decreeing that you are going to receive a salary only for those days when you are practically and physically present in the house. So you are going to have a roll call from now on. And I take the list of MPs and start reading for them to reply back, present or absent. And I started with the letter A. The first on the list was Ahmetov. Renat Leonidovich. He did not come to the parliament and was open about this. And I continued to call up everyone. Some of them started to attend the workplace more often because of political and public condemnation. A voting card was like a credit card, you know? You passed it to someone, someone voted instead of you, and one could even earn some money from that. And I had been thinking what to do with this. It was 2008. I called the Institute of Mathematics that ensured the maintenance of the RADAS voting system. Well, everybody knows that beep. This is the RADA system. I called them and said, well, guys, let's come up with a solution on how to ensure in-person voting. And then the current personal voting system was invented. Now, Dmitro Razumkov, the Speaker of the House, has turned it on. Basically, the system is simple ST, but efficient. It requires voting with two fingers. In order to vote, one has to keep one hand here and other here to vote simultaneously. How it used to be earlier, they had 10 seconds to run like that. Bang, 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 like up to eight volts. And when it was ready to be launched, 
I was removed from the position of the Speaker of the House. Can you imagine? 12 years. It took 12 years to launch the personal voting system, while 12 seconds were actually all that was needed. Generally, the Verkhovna Rada or the House is always blamed for everything, always treated as it is bad. However, this is the parliament that blocked the possibility of dictatorship in Ukraine. This is the parliament that did the right things in difficult times. Although it caused a lot of harm too. Specifically, when there was the case during the times of the party for regions. In this very chamber, Yanukovych, together with President Putin, passed the decision to extend the Russian Black Sea deployment in Crimea. This was the act of treason. We were in the opposition at that time and tried to block that voting. This was completely unconstitutional decision, which paved the way for illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014. I also recall the language bill that was happening here in the hall. This was the Russian idea too. That was a betrayal, betrayal of the nation. They betrayed not just the state or our history, they betrayed themselves, they betrayed their parents. You don't have to be a Nobel Prize winner to guess how this will end. For me personally, Ukraine appeared on the threshold of a default several times. I don't remember any person who wanted to be prime minister at that time. There hasn't been a damn thing here at all, just a field. And likewise along the entire border. And there are 2,200 kilometers of the border with Moscovites. The wall, it has been completely discredited. This is the model of fake news and mass disinformational campaign. They launched an unprecedented campaign, not only to discredit me, but to displace me from the position of prime minister. Well, I stand my ground. It's exactly what it is.